Good Morgen. Okay, uh, that's as much German I'll be talking except Danke at the end. So, um, welcome everybody. My name is Chu Ki Chen, and today I'll be telling you how to be an Android expert. Before I get started, the link on the slide is for the slide deck. Uh, so, in case you want to, for example, tweet about it and uh, you don't want to take a screenshot, you can download that PDF and use it on your phone. Um, another thing that I want to point out is uh, my Twitter handle is at Chuki because that link is also already tweeted and um, pinned onto my profile. Uh, so you don't have to take a picture if you are already following me. And I highly encourage you to do so because during the talk, you'll get some bonus material on Twitter. So let's go. Expert. Think of someone that you think is an expert. How do you know that she is an expert? Oh, she knows a lot about Android. OK, that will make her an expert. But how do you know that she knows a lot about Android? Well, maybe she wrote a book about Android and you read it, and that's how you learn the fundamentals. Maybe you were at a conference and you'll hear her speak and share her experience on Android. Or maybe you were not at the conference, but then you watch a recording later. Or something quite common is you are searching for that problem and you found her blog post. Or you got into Stack Overflow and then there it is, an answer from her. So the dictionary said that an expert is a person who has comprehensive and authoritative knowledge in a particular area. Well, this definition is quite different from what we just said earlier. If you go by the dictionary definition of an expert, it sounds like somebody who is put on a pedestal so that we can all worship. But if you go by the earlier way that we talk about who is an expert who blogs and speaks, an expert really is just someone that shares her knowledge. And you may think of it, OK, she shares because she knows so much. There is so much expertise that just could not be contained. But here, today, you all are going to learn the secret about being experts. The arrow doesn't go this way. It goes the other way. The more you share, the more expertise you gain. And then the more expertise you gain, the more you get to share. So this is actually a great way, a great positive cycle for you to become an expert. You share what you know now, you gain more expertise, and then you continue sharing and you build it up. How does that work? When we think we know something, it's a bunch of concepts in our head, sort of unorderly and jambled. But when we are trying to share, you need to take it out and make it linear. Because, well, when I talk, I say one word at a time. I'm not able to project my knowledge as is. We don't have that technology yet. So when you're trying to explain your concept of one after another, you need to explore the relationship between them so that it makes sense. And when you do this, sometimes you realize, oh, wait a minute. I don't really know how the star goes to the rectangle. And then you go investigate some more, and then you learn some more about what you thought you already know. So this is how sharing gives you expertise. Um, you can also learn that from some very old man called Aristotle, who said, the one exclusive sign of thorough knowledge is the power of teaching. If you say, wait, I mean, he's like way dead, and what does he know about Android development? I have another way to show you how sharing will give you more expertise. And it's called list view. How many of you know list view? All right, the vast majority of you. How many of you has explained list view to somebody else? OK, not as many. So for those of you that haven't, just you know, think about it. How do you actually explain how this view works? Well, there is an adapter which somehow contains the data, 
and then you have this view holder, and then you have to put them together, and then you need to make sure that the views are inflated only when you need to. So as you go through the exercise of explaining, you probably realize that, oh, wow, OK, that's how everything fit together. Because sometimes, as developers, all we do is copy and paste. And don't, we don't really think through what is the logic behind. But when you are sharing, when you're explaining, it forces you to actually think it through. And of course, nowadays, we also have recycle view. So if you think that you know this view very well, congratulations, you are also going to need to learn recycle view and perhaps explain it and get to know it better. So hopefully by this point, I have convinced you that sharing will actually give you more expertise. But some of you may be sitting there wondering, well, I have a full-time job. And then I go home and I take care of my family, and then I play video games, and then I travel. I mean, I don't have time to share. The good news is, sharing actually helps you save time. I discovered that a little bit accidentally. So what happened is this. What I usually do before I was sharing is, say this is my app, a very interesting architecture of four rectangles representing different components working together. Um, and I would like to introduce a new library. So the library, for example, is an ice cream cone. It's just a way, easy way to draw something that's not a rectangle. Um, so I drop the library in, but it doesn't work out of the box because it's not a box. Um, so I need to write the interfaces between the library and my code. So I started writing little bits of code so that I can put things together. And then I realized that, wait a minute, I don't really want to use the library as is. I want to customize it a little. So instead of the mint flavor, maybe I want to change it to chocolate flavor. But because I've already started doing it inside my project, I got confused and I changed the wrong bit. And now things doesn't work because now I don't have the proper code and I don't understand what's broken. I don't know whether it's my library is broken, my code is broken, the interface between the ice cream cone library and my code is not good or it's just um, the library that I pull in is just not good. So this is usually the point where I get so frustrated but things are so tangled that I don't really know how to debug it. Nowadays, I do something very different. So the first step, instead of putting it right into my project, is I will compile the Hello World sample. Usually when you use a library, they will give you a very, very simple use case to demonstrate what the library does. So completely separate from my main library, I mean my main app, I will compile the sample app and verify that it works. And then at this point, if I want to customize, then I can change the flavor to chocolate. And there's no other confusing bit to splash the chocolate on because it's an isolated project and I'm building it up from the most simple bit. And then I'll continue to add the interface around this project that I will need so that I can put it back into my main project. And this saved me so much time because I can debug how I use the library in a separate context so that if there's any problem, it's relatively small. I don't have a lot of things to get confused about. I don't really need to worry about how it interacts with my main project yet until I get to the point where I know this is how I want it to behave. And then I put it in and usually it just works. And what's really nice about that is once you have this isolated project, you can go ahead and upload it to GitHub and congratulations, you are suddenly an open source contributor. I don't know how many of you sometimes think about, oh, you know, I think I should uh, contribute to open source because it's good for the community, it's for good for my career, but it's so intimidating. I used to be like that. If I have to go look for some project and join and become a, a, a contributor, it just sounds very, very complex. But since then, what I have done is something like that. I have already used my work time, essentially, to make a project. And I upload to GitHub, and I share with everyone. Um, so I think you can try that, too. And one more thing that's nice about this technique is that the process of building up this sample project, how you customize, how you interface, is a blog post. You can just write about how you did that, what are the steps that you took, what difficulty you run into. And that is 
a blogging formula. Blogging is quite intimidating in the beginning because you have just an empty box. And once I've blogged a little bit, I find that having formulas like this help a lot. So I'll explain a little bit more what this blogging formula does. Um, usually, when I try to explain a problem that I have, I incorporate a lot of screenshot and code to explain things. So as I'm building up my Sci compilation, I will take screenshots of the different steps that I go through. So for example, in this case, I'm trying to figure out how to add a header to a recycler view. So I first make a recycler view with a grid layout that has two columns, and then I vary the column size, so it's three, uh, two, and one. Um, and then I also try to add a header. So I capture all those in screenshots, and then I also make sure that I have some code snippets so that I can tell people how to implement that. So the nice thing about this is not only that it's a great way to illustrate how to do things and how things look, but it takes up a lot of space. So instead of writing a great essay about how RecyclerView works, what I do is I put screenshot and I put some code snippets and then write a little bit of text in between. That makes it much less demanding. I mean, there's a reason why we are developers, right? I mean, if we are English majors, perhaps we will enjoy writing really, really long essays. But we are intimidated by writing a long piece. Um, so this is a good in-between where you're still explaining yourself, but you're using screenshots and code snippets. And as we all know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if you want to write a 10,000 word essay, it's very easy. You just put in five screenshots and five code snippets, and you're done. And the beauty of that is, it's not only that it's easy for you to write, it's actually easy for people to read. I mean, I don't know how many of times you search for something and you found this wall of text, and you're like, do I have to read this? Is this even relevant to my problem? And then you maybe reluctantly read it, but if it has screenshots and code snippets, then you can very quickly get a sense of what this article is going to be about and what you can copy and paste. So that makes it much more effective. So win-win, it's easier for you to write and easier for other people to read. Um, so that blogging formula, if I timed my tweets correctly, should already be on Twitter. Um, so there are a lot of links of what I said in this talk that I already blogged about. Um, this is all very meta because I like to blog about blogging and speak about blogging and speak about speaking and things of that kind. Um, so anyway, um, if you want to look, like, get more detail on how that works, you can read my blog post about blogging. Uh, so one more blogging formula that I find very useful is called a conference report. So what happens is this, right? Maybe you ask your boss, like, hey boss, can I go to attend Joycon Berlin? And your boss is like, well, if you are going to learn things, then I can pay for your ticket. And so to make sure that I know that you're learning things, I want you to give a presentation to the team of what you learn. And then you're like, Oh, I don't want to do that. So today I'm going to teach you one trick that will make that much easier and make, make it an enjoyable experience. So this blogging formula goes like this. First, introduction. Nothing really fancy. You can say something like, hey, I just came back from Joycon Berlin and it was amazing and I learned a lot. You know, two, three sentences. And then what you're going to do is you're going to use this trick just like the screenshot and the code snippets. You're going to have this thing that turns 140 characters into a very big area. And that's called Twitter. So what you're going to do is you're, during the conference, you're going to tweet about your experience. Um, and then when you're going back to write that blog post that is your conference report, you're going to embed that tweet back in. So instead of taking this much space, suddenly it takes that much space. And you look like you wrote a lot. So, OK, um, what are we going to tweet about? Well, there are many different things you can do. For example, you can say, I'm so excited. I don't know what I'm going to attend. Um, so this is just very quick little note about the conference. 
Um, or maybe you went to a talk and you thought that that was very interesting, so you can quickly say, oh wow, I went to the data persistence talk, and it was so cute because they're talking about how NoSQL and fighting against Realm and all these other things. Um, so like a quick summary of your impression about a session. Or you can get a little summary of, yeah, okay, it depends. That's the answer I got. Um, so these are very quick snippets of your experience during the conference. So you capture that instead of you go back later and you sit there and try to remember what you saw. So the tweets that I showed you earlier all have one thing in common. Don't know if anybody spot that. It's in blue. It's the hashtag. So you tweet, but maybe you're paying attention and you are not actually tweeting all the time. But the beauty about having a hashtag is everybody else will be posting about different aspects of the conference. So when you are home and you're trying to put together the report, you can click on the hashtag and then see what other people captured and embed that into your blog post. So somebody else is writing your conference report for you. But we, we all need to contribute, right? So I would love it if we start tweeting and using this hashtag. So that's the trick of turning 140 characters into a big space. Another one we mentioned that earlier already is pictures. Take pictures during the conference and then embed that into your blog post. So let's see some example of what pictures to take. Well, you can take the entrance and say, hello, Drycon Berlin, and that's it. You post it on Twitter, and then you can embed it afterwards, you know, as the beginning, or maybe after your introduction, just to show the environment. You can take a picture of your badge, um, and apparently she is the boss of Orga. That's great. Um, so a lot of different things that give you a sense of how the conference is like, you can take pictures of. A classic is taking a picture of Someone speaking on stage and saying that, oh, wow, you know, I'm very excited about the session on how to be an Android expert. Or you see all the decorations and you take a picture. I'm sure actually uh, some of you are already doing that. Maybe not professionally. Maybe you like to post a lovely meal you eat on Facebook. It's the same idea. You're just taking things as you see and then sharing it. And it's pretty lightweight when you're doing them bit by bit. Um, and then the little pin that looks really cool. Or maybe you saw double rainbow. I don't know how many of you saw that yesterday. It was amazing. Um, so capture that and then you can, then afterwards again, you can use the hashtag to select all these pictures and then put together into your conference report. And it's not that difficult to write afterwards because a lot of the work is already done during the conference and you're selecting things that represent your experience. So, two tricks, right? Tweet and picture. Third one is sketch notes. How many of you know what are sketch notes? How many of you have seen them? Great. If you don't, um, it's basically a way to take notes that is not just line after line. It's using the whole page as a two-dimensional surface, and then you vary your text size, maybe bigger and smaller, maybe have a little bit of picture in it. So, for example, let's see how a sketch note looks like. So, this is a sketch note from yesterday about a barcamp session. And it's a little bit like normal notes, but instead of having bullet points, we have stars, and we have ribbons, and we have quotes. Uh, so, this is something that you can learn. And in fact, if you were here yesterday at the barcamp, I actually taught people how to do it. Um, so. There are a few tricks that you can add to your normal sketch noting, I mean your normal note taking, and then it will become a sketch note. And the nice thing about sketch notes is that it's very visual. So it's a very good way to summarize what happened, and people just instantly get drawn to it. So if you go to Drycon Berlin and you go back and you show your boss, hey, this is what I learned, and at one glance he can see, oh, wow, okay, that's a lot of good material there. Then maybe you get to go again next year. And so for those of you who did not come for Barcam, I actually did a recording of the workshop that I did yesterday, so you can also go ahead and download that video and watch it. Um, again, it's on Twitter already. I have tweeted a link, which a lot of the links will also be the, on the last slide. So if you have the slide deck link, you can click on them later. And with all that, you have probably need to scroll for like two pages to get all the material that you have in your conference report. 
And then you can add a little conclusion that says, I had a great time at Joycon Berlin. I am really looking forward to next year. Done. Send it to your boss and then share with your team. And people can enjoy the conference and know that this is a great place to learn. So, so far, I've been talking about blogging. Let's take it one step up to speaking. The reason why I say speaking is taking it one level up is that it's interactive, right? Like you are going there and then you get to talk to a lot of different people. And the great thing about speaking is that when I'm at a conference and I gave a talk, then afterwards people come talk to me and they ask me questions about what I shared on stage. And that makes networking so much easier. I mean, I don't know how many of you love networking, but it's usually really awkward in the first minute, right? You come and you say, hi, my name is Chuki. I'm an Android developer. Oh, what do you do? Right? So you have to kind of warm up the conversation before it gets interesting. But if you give a talk, then people sort of already know who you are. They sort of already have one idea, at least, of what one topic that you're interested in, which is what you presented. So then you can just jump in, right? Like you don't need to do the little dance, and you can just say, "Oh, hey, I went to your talk, and I found that technique of using GitHub to track my essay writing very interesting, or whatever session that you presented." And then you you just roll off, right? You don't have to deal with the awkward part of networking. So I really enjoy that. Um, so when I tell people that please go speak because that makes conference going much more pleasant, you get a lot more out, that's what they tell me. I have nothing to say. I mean, what, what am I going to give a talk about? And I actually heard this so much that I have a talk about I have nothing to say. Again, the link is on Twitter already, so I'm not going to actually play you the video. You can watch it later. I'm going to just share one point about how you are wrong that you have nothing to say. So I don't know about you, but when I code, it is not always perfect. There are always times when I'm like, oh, I thought, you know, this is just a quick 10-minute thing. I'll put, put, quickly put this together, and then it will just work. And of course, it doesn't work. And this is how I know that I should be either speaking or blogging about something. If one task takes more time than I expected, that's a signal that some other people may be struggling with the same thing, and I should share it. And that some people may actually just be me in six months because I don't have a perfect memory. So sometimes I just forget that, oh, right, yeah, you know, to use that, I need to use this flag. So, you know, sometimes you're not even changing your own code, right? Um, maybe you're using this library, and then you heard that there's a new version, and you bump up the number. And nothing ever goes wrong when you changed the version of a, num uh, of a library you're using, right? Never. I heard you laugh, and indeed, usually sometimes you're like, wait a minute, why is it suddenly not showing this view? Oh, it's because something is deprecated, but I didn't know that. So that is your cue that you need to write it down and share it for you and for other people so that nobody needs to do this again. I love the way my friend put it. Um, so she said that I'm the idiot that went down the rabbit hole first, and I'm here to tell you which path leads to fluffy bunnies versus angry moles. Right? You did that already. You're already suffering the consequence of using the wrong flag. So I will highly encourage you to actually share that so that other people don't have to encounter the angry moles. They can just go straight to the fluffy bunnies and get things done. So when I was doing that, what I did was I tried to have a little notebook and I tried to write down all these little observations. And I will encourage you to do that too. I call it the rant book because I'm really angry when I do that. It's like, oh, why this is taking three hours? Um, and the nice thing is actually once I started thinking about wanting to write down things that don't work well, my brain automatically started noticing things. And nowadays I can pretty much just like, oh yeah, that, that, that's, that's a bloggable moment. Well, maybe take a little bit of time to get to that automatic point, but this is a great way to get started. So I hope you, I have convinced you that you, I have nothing to say is wrong. You all have something to say. The second objection that I get is, well, no one wants to listen to me. 
I mean, who am I? There are so many famous people in the Android community. Well, if I write something, why does it matter? Well, let me tell you something. How many of you go to meetups? Yeah, a lot of you. Where do you think the speakers of the meetup come from? It's from the community, right? If you live in Berlin, probably the speakers are from Berlin. And that means they are you. They are not, the Berlin doesn't have a secret club of speakers that they can just keep requesting people to come and speak at meetups. It's the people that are attending, and that's you. You are the one that's going to be tapped to share. And seriously, if you don't trust me that you will have a place to speak, go and ask your meetup organizer and say, hey, I would like to give a talk. I guarantee you, they'll be like, oh, thank you so much, because I'm always struggling every month to find somebody to share. They'll be so happy to have you. So someone wants to listen to you. And the nice thing about meetups is that you don't have to go and give a 40-minute talk right away. You can start with a show and tell. Maybe you just bring in a little piece of code that say, hey, I'm trying to do Dagger 2, and I am using it this specific way, and I run into this problem, and this is how I solve it. You just explain it in three minutes. And then maybe you get to the next level, do a lightning talk, maybe five minutes, ten minutes, and with slides and with a little bit of illustrations. And then you can work your way up to a full talk. And you know what? The people at the meetup are your friends. I mean, you've seen them every month for a while, and they are friendly. Like, they are not going to be like, hey, that talk was horrible. Give me my money back. Well, first of all, it's free, so, you know, they, they cannot demand a refund. Um, and then, usually people are not mean like that, right? They will come and tell you, oh, wow, I have no idea that that thing even existed. Thank you so much for sharing. But we are so harsh on ourselves that somehow we think that what we know is obvious which is not true. I mean, it's obvious to you because you just figure out how to do it, but it's not obvious to other people. So go to your meetup, share your knowledge. And the next level from speaking at a meetup is the speaking at the conference. So for example, at Joycon Berlin, the reason why it's a level up is it's a little bit different from speaking at a meetup. There are more people there probably, but the other thing is there are other speakers, right? Usually when you speak at a meetup, there's one speaker per night. The nice thing about having other conference speakers is that you get to learn from each other as well. So usually when you are speaking, you tend to have some speaker activity or maybe a, a dinner together, and you really get to know a much smaller subset of the people that are attending the conference. And these people are a self-selected group that are eager to share, and they really want to help people, right? So you meet them, you develop a relationship with them, and maybe you continue that on Twitter or wherever, and now you have a group of people that are much more willing to answer your question because they already know you, right? If you just post a question on Stack Overflow, yeah, some people answer it for points, but if you are doing it with the group of speakers that you meet, chances are the quality of the answers will be higher. So this is kind of the secret perk of speaking at conferences. The best part is meeting other speakers. At least that's how I feel, and I loved it. So if you want to speak at a conference, how does that work? Usually there's a CFP, which stands for Call for Proposals, not for papers. Sometimes people ask me, um, do I need to submit a paper for your CFP? No, 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 no. And maybe if you are a PhD candidate, you need to write a paper, but it's not like that. So a CFP, what it does is that it's usually pretty short, maybe three paragraphs of what you want to talk about, why this topic. Um, and then usually it comes with a bio to explain why you, why should you be uh, explaining this particular idea. So why this topic? You will submit a CFP that has a title and an abstract. I think the easiest way to explain how does that work is to show you an example. Um, so here is one, it's called Kotlin Coroutine, so that would be the title. And then we have three paragraphs of text to explain what are we going to do in this talk. So let's dissect it and I can kind of tell you what makes a good uh, proposal. 
So first, usually what you do is you define the problem, like what is the topic, what are we going to be talking about? So in this case, we're talking about asynchronous code. Um, it's great because it's straightforward with our long list of callbacks. Um, and then, so in Kotlin specifically, what happens? So next, after you define the problem, you want to add some details, some meat, what I call. So very specifically, what are you going to cover? You may think of it as keyword stuffing, essentially. You can talk about specific things that you would like to talk about. So for example, what is a lightweight thread? How does suspension work? So it's not just on a high level. I would say, OK, sure, you know, we will talk about Rx Java, but it's so big. Like, what are we exactly going to be talking about? So give some details so that people have confidence that this is something that will be interesting. And finally, this is a sales pitch. You're trying to sell it to the conference organizers that this is going to be an excellent talk. So sell it. Your last line should always be a takeaway. So for example, in this case, we'll say, well, you will we'll be talking about coroutines, the power of async and wait, and how you can benefit from defining your asynchronous computations using suspend functions. And this way, people know if they come to this talk, what are going to take home. And I have one little secret to share with you, and that is the magic word, you. So when you are writing your proposal, you may think, be thinking about, what well, I am going to share this, and I am going to teach you this. That's fine when you're writing your first draft, but before you submit, kind of spell check and turn I into you, because that makes it so that you are actually thinking about the audience, right? So when I'm coming into the conference, usually the proposal is exactly the same text as what you see in the program, and you realize, like, well, you are going to do this, and then the attendee think, wow, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm going to learn all those things, and they get, they get excited, and they come to your session. So if you're excited about this session, it's going to be tomorrow, and it's actually going to be happening in, in, in this conference. So now you have convinced the organizers why this topic, the next step is convince them why you, and that is your bio. Um, so what I will recommend is that you blog, right? We will talk about that already. So if you have a blog out there, then people have a good idea of like how you approach problems, how you explain things. So they give you a little bit of confidence of how you will be able to do that in a talk. Even better, if you did uh, speak at a meetup, you can have it recorded. So most of the meetups don't really have resources to have a cameraman to record and then put things together with a slice. Uh, but what you can do is you can use, if you are on a Mac, you can use QuickTime, or actually on any platform, you can use this software called OBS, so it's Open Broadcaster Software. Essentially, it's a screencasting way. So you're recording your screen, and then you turn on your microphone, so you record your voice as well. And then you have a recording of you giving a talk. That's an excellent way of try before you buy, right? You give a talk at your meetup, um, and then you maybe apply to speak at a conference, and then you can put in the notes to organizer and say, here is a sample of a talk that I gave. So they can take a look and say, oh, wow, yeah, she can explain things in English, not developer speak. That's great. That way, people can actually learn. Um, so this is a great way to show that you are the right person to give this talk. Um, I actually also gave a short talk, a 15-minute talk of how to write a good proposal. So these are the steps that I go through. Um, I just show you today the reverse engineer step of reading proposals from other conferences and trying to figure out why it's compelling and see if you can emulate that. Um, so these are the other steps. And again, uh, it's on Twitter already. Um, so if you want to go watch that. And at the end, I will also have a slide with a link to it. So great, you submitted a talk and accepted. Yay, now what? Uh, bad news, you actually have to write the talk because the proposal is only three paragraphs long, so you actually have to prepare it. But the good news is that I have a newsletter called Technically Speaking. Um, it's a newsletter focusing on how to be a good speaker at a technical conference. And every other week, you will get information about how to write an effective proposal, or maybe when you're on stage, how to make sure that your slides are of good contrast so that people all the way at the back of the room can see it. Um, and I actually have stickers for the newsletter. So if you are a subscriber, come find me. I can give you a sticker or two. All right, so this is all great, happy. We are, you are, we are all going to share, and we are all going to become experts. Um, but I would like to address the elephant in the room, which is that 
a lot of people will say, great, yeah, I'll be a speaker, but what if people found out that I'm not an expert and they found out I'm an imposter? That would be horrible. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to expose myself only to be discovered that I actually don't know anything. Well, if we're talking about blogging, I have good news and bad news for you. You have no readers. Who are you? You're not famous. So you are not actually going to be having a lot of people attacking you. So that's the good news. I mean, the bad news is that you, are f you feel like you're just speaking to the void and nobody is listening. But like I said earlier, you are going to be maybe reading it six months later yourself so that you can copy and paste that command line and do that one task that you keep forgetting how to do. So I will use it to your advantage, right? The fact that you have no readers means that you are free to experiment. You can try things and nobody's going to complain that, oh, that was horrible, because I don't think you'll get a lot of readers in the beginning. And one other tip that I have is you can moderate your comments. Um, if you are afraid that someone's going to say, oh, this was horrible, or, this is such a childish way of solving this problem, you can moderate your comment. You don't have to let everyone and anyone just scribble on your blog. I started doing that because I was timid, um, but then what ended up happening is that a lot of people will be like, oh great, I love the way you explain this, but um, that's not what my professor asked me to do. So um, if you can change your example so that it involves birds and I can talk about how you can identify them, that would be great. And I'm like, no, that's your homework. Like, I'm not going to do your homework. And I'm not also going to have you ask a question that I'm not going to answer and make it look bad on me. So I moderate. That's fine. You, it's your blog, your corner of the internet. You control the rules. Um, speaking is a little bit different because it's interactive. So one thing that's scary about speaking is Q&A. Uh, someone asks you a question and maybe you don't know the answer. Or more commonly, someone will come to the mic and say, well, I um, don't really have a question, but um, I like, just want to talk about how great I am because I know this one thing that's not really related to what you're talking about. And I'm like, okay, fine. Um, what's your point? And the point is just they just want to take up some space because they think that they are amazing. Um, so Q&A is very stressful. Um, I have two tricks for you. One is, you don't have to take Q&A. Nobody said that if you are giving a talk that you have to stand there and take questions. So if you are first starting to speak, you can say something like, thank you for listening. I won't be taking questions, but please come find me. I will be around the stage a little bit and we can discuss off stage." That's perfectly fine. You don't have to take questions. But if you want to take questions, there's a second trick that you can use, which is say, I don't know. If someone's at the mic, they ask you something that you've never encountered before, you can actually say, well, I have never encountered that before. And that's it. You don't have to know everything to give a talk. You're there to share one little piece of knowledge. And if you are done, you're done. You don't have to be questioned. Um, so I showed you earlier this objection number two, nobody wants to listen to me. And I just want to quickly go over one way that this hurts really badly, is if you are submitting to a conference and they said, uh, sorry, I don't want to take your talk. And it feels really bad. And I've, that has happened to me before. I've submitted talks about testing that nobody wants to listen to. And the thing is, I don't talk about those things on the internet, right? I only tell you that, hey, I'm doing the uh, Joy-Con keynote, it's amazing. Um, but actually, a lot of speakers experience that. Pretty much everybody has their rejection stories. And yes, it is really tough. Yes, it feels really bad, but keep doing it because one day, all the variables will line up and you'll be speaking in a conference. It's a numbers game. I don't really have a good way to encourage you by, by saying that if you do A, B, C, and D, you're guaranteed to be accepted. Just keep trying. So with that, I hope I get you all excited about blogging and speaking, about how you're going to share and gain more expertise, and how we can all make the community stronger. Danke. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chuki. Are you prepared to take one or two very scary and stressful questions from the audience? Um, if we have time. Do we have the time? Yes, we do have time for at least two questions or so. Nobody has questions. 
Oh my God, that, that was a perfect talk. Thanks a lot, Chuki. And uh, you will be around the whole day on this conference. And for those of you who want to speak to Chuki, she'll be, she'll be there.